I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, Amy, to come up. She's chairing the next section. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. What a thrill it is for me to be able to look at all these familiar faces, but faces that have somehow changed over time. Um, so it's wonderful. Uh, today's session is on evaluation, reflection, and innovation, which actually could have been the title of this whole conference in a way. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce the first speaker who is going to talk about reflective practice at Punahou, Paris Priori Kim. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so honored to be part of this program and part of this group. And I'm very honored to share my work with you today. So I will be speaking to you about my dissertation, Understanding Reflective Practice at Punahou School, from Institutional Aspiration to uh, Practitioner Action. But ultimately, I'm going to be talking to you about understanding reflective practice in the context of my own practice, and actually in the context of the education doctorate. So beginning with my dissertation, Clinical's vision is to promote an enlightened and challenging program that is continually examined and renewed uh, to strengthen it. I was intrigued by those terms, examination and renewal, because although one has a sense of this forward momentum at Clinical, because of our, our scale, it's hard to apprehend exactly how that's taking place, where it's taking place, whether it's taking place. So for the purposes of my study, I translated those two words into a single term, reflective practice, which actually describes um, the dynamic process of critical examination. Next. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my study sought to understand how the fundamental school context impacted reflective practice, which mechanisms impeded or supported that practice, and um, how reflective practice impacted teaching and learning. And when I first start, started out on, the, on this journey, I was really fascinated or focused on the last question. I wanted to understand outcomes. But as my study progressed, I recognized the richness of information generated around the first two questions and actually became much more absorbed by, by those. And uh, that's what I'm going to be presenting to you today. Um, and I think it offers general insight. So as a practitioner at Punahou, it was really important for me to offer my participants time and choice, understanding demands, understanding the pace. Um, there were 29 participants. Uh, each of them received a series of three questionnaires. Each questionnaire was uh, comprised of a single short answer question, although the answers generally were not short. Um, they had one month within which to respond. That meant that they could choose the days, the times, um, it meant that they could revisit their answers. It meant that they could edit their answers. Uh, they had a full month to respond. They also could choose whether to participate in the summer or the fall. I wanted them to, I figured they knew what their, their rhythms were. They knew when they would have time to bring to this exercise. And so they could choose to receive the questionnaires in June, July, or August, June, July, and August, or August, September, October. Um, I mentioned that their answers were overall um, really wonderfully rich and descriptive. But I didn't anticipate that there would be a disparity between the summer group and the fall group, and there was. The responses that came to me from the summer group were two to three times lengthier and more comprehensive than those that came, came in the fall, um, which actually became a finding for me. So I turned to the literature to guide me in the development of these questions for the questionnaires. And Donald Schoen, uh, Stephen Brookfield, and Jack Mazzaro in particular um, provided frameworks um, for me to um, encourage thinking around reflective practice. And in, in order to give you a sense of how those frameworks describe reflective practice, I'm going to ask you to play along with me for a bit. I'd like you to capture in your mind an event, an issue, something that routinely crosses your desk or falls onto your plate, something that requires your response, a student issue, parent complaint, personnel issue, whatever it is. Um, so capture that in your mind. And then answer this question, what do you do when this happens routinely in your practice? What do you do when that happens? Okay. So I imagine that ideas, responses are bubbling up for you, maybe a range of them, um, based on your 
experience in your job, based on the tacit knowledge you have about doing your job, based on your expertise. So now I'd like you to capture that same issue, event, problem. <clears throat> Only this time, I'd, ask, I'd like you to answer this question. What assumptions guide your actions when you respond in that way? What assumptions underlie those responses? And now I imagine that you're having to dissect those responses a little bit. You might, if, if I give you, give you enough time, you might be able to understand and explore the experiences that led up to those responses, your life experiences, your professional experiences, your personal philosophy, your approach to education, all of those things that are wrapped up in those responses that you aren't necessarily aware of when you are responding. And now I'd like you to think about those times, be they many or a few, where you're stopped in your tracks, where your reflexive um, response is, is not the right thing. And you stop and you either take a pivot or you step back um, and you, you don't reflexively respond. I call this the flux in the flow of practice. And when I ask my participants about the things that create this flux in their routines, this, this stop action, um, they came up with several, several of these factors. The first being surprise when they encounter an unanticipated event or outcome. Teachers in particular, when they encounter an unexpected outcome. Um, when they experience shifts in their life experience, becoming a parent changed um, practice for some people. Um, teaching a new discipline, teaching in a new grade level, moving to a new school. When they are offered new knowledge or introduced to new knowledge, when they con are confronted with questions that are unfamiliar to them when they are required to pause, when someone says, wait a minute, stop, we need to think about this. Um, so it's an external factor. And across the board, um, they all mentioned um, this notion of flux when they encountered thinking that was divergent from their own. And it was most powerful when that divergence um, was encountered within a, a collegial group. So what does this flux in the flow of practice have to do with reflective practice? Once again, I'm going to ask you to play along with me a little bit. Um, first of all, since I started speaking, have any of you stopped breathing? <laughs> no, right? We've all been breathing, unaware of it, but in taking air, exhaling air. Um, so I'm going to ask you to practice something with me. I'd like you to take an inhalation on the count of four. I'll count. So you're going to take a deep breath on the count of four, and then you're going to exhale on the count of six. Okay, so here we go. Inhale, one, two, three, four. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, what you've done, a couple things. You've applied in a mindfulness to your breath, something that you were doing involuntarily before you were unaware. You've now applied a mindfulness and intention to your breath. But you also, if you were to do that in a series of four or five, you would actually activate a little nerve in your diaphragm that triggers your parasympathetic nervous system and overrides your sympathetic nervous system, which is the, tr the trigger from uh, fight or flight. So if you breathe that way, you actually trigger your parasympathetic nervous system that allows you to step back, take a measured and considered approach. Um, when we encounter fluxes in the flow of practice, we can sympathetically react or respond. We go to plan B, we come up with the next best solution, uh, we triage. And certainly, those are important ways of uh, responding in, in certain cases. But we also have the option of stepping back, exploring our assumptions, perhaps suspending them, creating room in our minds for shifts in thinking, and creating a platform for some real learning about ourselves and our practice. So a little bit redundant, but I'm going to do a quick sum of the anatomy of reflective practice. We come aware of this tacit knowing, this routine reaction and response. Um, we realize that we can hunt down our assumptions, that's what Brookfield calls it, where you're actually digging to understand what's motivating your actions. We create room and, and welcome paradigmatic shifts in our, think or in our thinking, ultimately creating this um, traction for transformational learning. And Mesero says that when we do this, when we do this kind of exploration in dialogue with others, that enhances the potential for transformational learning. So once I found out what created the flux in the flow of practice was separated practitioners, my participants, from their routines, 
Um, I wanted to find out what uh, mechanisms impacted their engagement in reflective practice. Um, across the board, um, overwhelmingly, they mentioned collegiality and sense of community. Um, I think this came up in the presentations about PLCs yesterday as well. This, is, this was an important factor, not just because it creates a venue for discourse, but more importantly, it creates a safe venue for challenging discourse. It creates a safe venue for um, conversation that might be laden with tension and divergence without the fear of discord. They all perceived a valuation, an institutional valuation of reflective practice. Um, they used words like emphasis, encouragement, expectation in their responses to me. Uh, this ties in with collegiality and sense of community. They appreciated the diversity of the Cornell community and how that offset, that was a, a platform that offset um, their assumptions, multiple ways of knowing, multiple approaches, multiple philosophies, multiple ways of doing. Autonomy is huge at Bona Hall. It's embedded in the culture. Uh, faculty and administration have a lot of leeway um, to exercise personal judgment, to initiate um, ideas. And they, the practitioners, uh, sorry, the participants all mentioned that autonomy was a, a player because it allows you to deviate from routine. You don't have to do things in a, in a, um, in a group. They recognized um, and actually appreciated the resources committed to professional development, um, resources that really fostered um, or, 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 or introduced them to new knowledge, that brought new knowledge to them or that took them to new knowledge. This was interesting because uh, they described um, this feeling of sort of weightiness when it came to the cyclical evaluation, having to prepare for it, having to invest their time in it. But once again, across the board, um, those that mentioned cyclical evaluation said, in the end, it was time well spent. And otherwise, I may not have stopped to assess my practice and to uh, examine it as closely. And lastly, practitioner mindset was mentioned, an inclination or readiness for reflection. Um, you'll note that I have asterisks after autonomy and practitioner mindset because um, insofar as they can foster reflective practice, you can imagine they can also impede it if someone doesn't have to engage, if someone isn't ready or inclined. <clears throat> the data suggested that the greatest obstacle to reflective practice, I wonder if you can guess, is the absence and time, uh, the absence of time and space to reflect. Now, what do I mean by space? The participants described um, distance as being an important factor, the ability to separate themselves from their routines physically, um, a lot physically, some figuratively, um, to create this room for perspective, the, the time away, either travel away or summer vacations. Um, they also described needing room in their heads for more, they're sort of at capacity. Um, and this, is a, this, I, this resonates with me in particular. Um, they describe not really being able to give themselves permission to pause. They don't want to let any balls drop. They want to keep everything going at the, at the routine pace. So that segues into understanding reflective practice in the context of my own practice. Some of you may recall that when Steve Markerhausen was here, he told, uh, brought, uh, shared a metaphor um, about a boulder with us. And, and the tale goes, a traveler is moving through the, the woods and encounters this enormous boulder. And she contemplates whether to go around it, whether to go over it, whether to break it apart. And he says that comprises uh, first order reflection. But if the boulder prompts the traveler to review the journey, to re-examine the journey, to reconsider the path, that's second order reflection. Over the course of this work, I recognize that I've become incredibly expertise at moving and circumventing boulders. And now I'm far more interested in reconsidering the path and evaluating the journey. The nature of reflective work is disruptive. It offsets, it upsets, and I actually think it's made me more disruptive. Um, my work revolves a lot around problem solving and problem shooting for multiple con constituencies. Um, and I'm really 
no longer at all satisfied with seeking the sound solution or the good outcome problem by problem. I'm far more interested in directing um, my attention and my colleagues' attention toward the broad field in which these problems germinate. And I'm really questioning as to, um, I have questions in about the discernment as to whether our, um, our actions are actually addressing symptoms or causes. This work has also placed me simultaneously in and hovering above my practice. Um, there may be some of you that, that understand that or felt that same duality when we were doing our action research. Um, what this has required is sort of this continual tap between cognition and metacognition, and I've actually had to gain control over my cognitive process in order to, to recognize and, and honor competing values. Um, I've become far more interested in, um, and inclined, well actually I was always inclined to towards synthesis and integration, but I suppose I see a greater value to it. I'm, um, when it came to um, reviewing my data, I started coding and I found that it was very reductive, that it was leaving things out. And I shifted to a more impressionistic approach and an integrative approach um, so that nothing that was truly important and meaningful was missed. And I think that's affected my thinking in general overall. So I'd like to submit that the education doctorate has been training us all toward reflective practice. And I'm gonna make some statements about this, and you may or may not agree, but I hope that some of them resonate with you in, in at least a small way. It's created the time and space for reflection. For me in particular, it's, it's disrupted this pattern of action and reaction without reflection. It certainly has leveraged diversity and multiplicity towards reflect, reflective practice, and I'm so appreciative of the convergences that it's compelled between our disparate personal and professional narratives. Um, it's certainly given me um, new vantage points, and I, I appreciate that it's really dislodged me from my patterns by understanding your patterns. It's created the flux against the flow of practice. It's stopped us all. And it's discharged from this, this, this notion of tacit knowing. It's really propelled us toward um, examination and evaluation and synthesis. It offers a pedagogy that disrupts, and I think that's the intention of the education doctorate. Um, there's a social action arm, a social justice arm to this, and so I, I truly believe that it's meant to be disruptive. Um, it's, it's forced us to question and deconstruct our practice, and therein lies the traction. For, for change, I believe. So for me, the journey begins now. I believe that this cohort has created traction for improvement and change, and I'm loath for that to dissipate. I believe that the conversations, the, the discourse, the convergences that have been generated among us in this group have actually created a healthy flux in the flow of educational practice in the state of Hawaii. And sensing the power of that, I'd like to ask this question, what next? Not just for me, but for all of us as a collective, as a community of professionals that we forged here. So I'm leaving you with this question, what next? And you know how I'd like to ask questions. <laughs> share some examples from your research of disrupted practice that was disrupted by reflection? Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, um, a lot of this, a lot of the disruption had to do with affective mm. relation, relationships in the classroom. Um, um, assumptions being made about why children um, learn or behave the way they do. Um, 
there were, um, and, and some of this came from, I think a lot of it um, came from partnerships or even informal ones. I mean, what was interesting is that there were lots of formal structures that were mentioned um, that, that created conversation. So a teacher would encounter something and then speak with another teacher, sometimes in formal uh, gatherings, but oftentimes in very informal gatherings. Um, that was interesting to me, that so much of this happened in conversation outside of um, formal structures. So um, I think there were assumptions about, there are assumptions about parents that changed um, after people became parents. There were um, assumptions about um, behaviors that changed um, after some reflection. And after people, I guess what I should say is, following the reflect, reflection, change, the change of the approach is what was telling to the participants. They actually altered their approaches. Um, thank you so much. I mean, you raised the question of the arts, and we've been talking in the program about the practitioner and uh, the work of the practitioner in the form of artistry. Uh, and to get away from that sort of very narrow notion of research, right? Mm -hmm. uh, artistry, the artist is exactly, the artist is the model. The artists are people who challenge boundaries, mm -hmm. disrupt practices, try things in new ways, and experiment mm -hmm. in a experiment in the broader sense of experiment, not in the scientific experiment that is seen uh, is as trying things out, exploring new territories. Mm -hmm. So I would like to go. Mm -hmm. We're all on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wanted to respond as a scientist and someone who heads the current Hawaii Educational Research Association that many of the scholars I work with consider themselves artists, um, even if it's with numbers. And, and they challenge in their own ways by the findings that they find and put out there for practitioners. And I, I always encourage research to come up to practice. There's, there's no way around that. Um, and then, Currently, when people submit articles or even presentations for the conference or for the journal, I push back and I say, and how does this relate to practice? How can the teacher take this into the classroom? How can the, the um, administrator take this into the school? Mm -hmm. And many of them, um, I, I tell them to reflect on their art and what it is that they're doing. So I, I think there's a connection there. And so it's a slightly a response to Hunter, you know, talking about art and youth, and definitely we're bringing it up. But there is an art form even in the numbers, even in the statistics, and the quantitative research. Thank you, Karen, for just kind of listening to what you were saying. Um, 
I was uh, experiencing as you were speaking a, a really quick reflection again, and you're right. I think it's true for all of us that this journey that we've taken and then the writing of dissertation and the immersion in our study is really, truly, totally reflective. So I sat here and I felt like I was at a retreat. <laughs> that you're speaking directly to me, but directly to everyone else. So thank you. Thank you. It is so actually that relates to the question. I think we can retreat for 15 or 20 minutes and take a reflective journey. With the tools that you have, with the knowledge, with the with the experience that you have, I think we can. I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, John, I knew you as well. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing that breath at the I I but no, that was, that was really great. Um, I do appreciate um, the explanation of the different levels of reflection. Um, that helps me a little better because I'm, I reflect well up here, but you know, it, it goes to a certain extent right. and then it stops. Right. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, my God. God. Thank you for explaining <laughs> this. <laughs> Why don't you take over? Well, uh, it's probably came up in the data yeah. that, that there's a lot of budding reflections, but a lot of it doesn't make it to fruition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, so I was just going to say that. A big, a big pool. It's an individual journey, but as leaders who work in schools and, and direct groups of people, how do you then take it to the next level of everybody getting close to the same level, or at least? Thinking about that. I don't know if there's a, I mean, the word sameness is, is, is tricky for me, mm -hmm. but I think that um, going back to what Ned wrote there, is when we plumb these assumptions, when we plumb our thinking in dialogue with one another, um, that's where transformational learning will really have a chance to occur. I think that has implications for leadership, because if you are trying to um, approach something reflectively, I don't think it's, in my opinion, from, from my understanding. I don't know how that's efficacious if that's going to be if you do the reflection and then have every, invite everyone into it. I think it's, it's uh, if, if, you're, if you're trying to practice reflection um, in a community, somehow that community needs to be convened in that process. Mm -hmm. right. so I, I understand and appreciate what Chuck is saying about pushing back um, a mathematical article to make it more artistic, but I'm, I've been thinking as we've all been talking here what our kuleyama is as educators, and I've always been worried, and they've heard me talk about it all the time, that um, when you read the newspaper and you watch the news, and at the same time as an educator, I think about the downplay that we've done in, in the humanities. So my background is art and, and English. So that reflective part becomes part of who your thread is. Mm -hmm. What scares me and actually repulses me a lot of times is our society is so hell-bent on science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, and math. Mm -hmm. And I get that, and I love that you push back and make sure that the two are melded, but I really worry that the, the love for reflection and the, how you build that in a child is done through the humanities, and I worry that we're going in this direction, and I and I, it's just my own soapbox that I really want to pull kids back to, and our our own teachers, and we we actually set time aside for them to do written reflection, um, and it's unfortunately we ha unfortunately we have to set time aside for that. Um, I jotted, you know, we need to set a space aside for teachers, but um, I think on a larger scale, we really as educators have to say. Love the science, technology, engineering, and math. Love it. Love that you push back on it and continue to do it because um, I worry that our children are losing the, the ability to see the world beautifully as you have and in reflection. So thank you for saying that. Do I have a minute to respond to that? I, I appreciate that. Um, my background is in art as well. Um, um, but what I found, and I, I didn't talk too much about the, the uh, my methodologies, but I maximum variation found them very diverse group across uh, faculty and administration, across the disciplines, across the grade levels. Um, I don't know who was you know, anonymous, but I can say across the board, um, these 
responses were rich in anecdotes, rich in exploration, and rich in feeling. There's a lot of feeling. And I'd like to suggest that no matter what your orientation, um, when you are asked to review a part of yourself and speak about those things that are of deep value to you, when you talk about your commitments, when you talk about um, your, your successes and your failures, I think you engage feeling. And to me, if you can do that, that's reflective. Whether you're talking to uh, the computer geek or whether you're talking to um, you know, the art teacher, um, I, I, I found, and that's what Hubble's trying to, the questions are really important. Accessing that in people was really important. Um, I guess I also wanted to comment about that notion of, of finding time for children to reflect. I think we can make our own reflections transparent with our kids. And, um, and, and introduce new model reflection. You know what, you know, yesterday it just didn't work, and so I went home and I reworked it, and let's try this today. That's making my reflection really transparent. So I think there are lots of ways of, of introducing it um, subtly and, and actually reflexively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I so appreciate what you're saying, because I, I, I feel that, that edge as well, and I feel like that's really, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I you're right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. What a great way to start the morning. Our second speaker today is 